Hello students, I apologize for the lateness of um, the next two videos, this one and the next one. Um, things got a little hectic and I was not able to make them. So um, this one is gonna cover um, the week that we focused on chapters 12 and 13 in our textbook. Um, it's gonna cover social class poverty in the American dream and models of community. And so for chapter 12, which talks about social class poverty and the American dream, um, it talks about what social class is. And one of the things that makes this identity very different than some of the other ones we covered is that social class is something that we can actually move through different ones. And so it's not quite as static as some of the other identities. Um, what's important to note is that there is a big difference between social class and socioeconomic status. And socioeconomic status is um, really, you know, kind of when you talk about like upper, upper middle, middle, lower middle, lower socioeconomic status. Um, and, and it definitely relates to like wealth, poverty, um, and oppression. Um, but social class has been um, linked strongly with Marxian um, uh, theories and um, it is organized sort of in the shape of a pyramid with the kind of higher social classes at the top, they're much smaller and at the bottom is the much larger lower classes. Um, the, the important thing to note with this is that it's sort of the way that the, the group of individuals that may fall in lower or higher socioeconomic classes um, may come together in community and some of the similarities that they might have. Um, the, the text kind of goes on to talk about class culture and sort of what that looks like and how that develops. Um, the, the book talks about being poor in America and the American dream and the way that, you know, America was kind of set up as this place where, and in the quote, um, it talks about the land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for every man with opportunity for each according to his ability or achievement. And so the idea is that we have the freedom and chance to succeed and to kind of move through um, social classes. So have that social class mobility. Um, but what we realize what we recognize, especially after um, having read the rest of this textbook and, and having the discussions that we've had this semester, that's not always possible for everyone. And so the textbook in um, on page 362, box 12.4, talks about the privilege walk activity, which you may be familiar with. You may have also engaged in one at some point. There are some difficulties I have with this activity is that one, you're kind of outing people um, when you do this activity in front of other people and with groups, um, and that can be really difficult and challenging. And so I don't 100% love this activity, but I like what it's trying to get at is that not everybody has the same starting point as everyone else when it comes to that social class mobility. And so different factors, you know, these different identities that we've already discussed this semester may make it a little bit easier for some individuals to have that mobility than others. And so to kind of take myself as an example, um, you know, I have had a lot of social class mobility throughout my life, um, mostly based on my education. Um, and so while there were not trials and, and difficulties to gaining my education, um, I recognize that there were areas of privilege that allowed me to ultimately get the education that I have. Um, you know, financially there were challenges and, and still continue to be with student loans and things like that. Um, but also, um, you know, the fact that nobody in my family had graduated from college, um, that made it really challenging trying to navigate the systems and um, know what choices to make and, and things like that. Um, coming from a family that was very poor and in a lot of, um, you know, credit card and, and other types of debt, um, it just set me up on that same path as well, because that's who I was learning from. Um, but I recognize that the privileges I have as a white individual, as a Christian, um, you know, as a nationalized citizen of the United States, all of these different things um, really have benefited me um, and helped me, you know, deal with the challenges that I faced in my education. So some of the um, issues that the text gets into then that are related to this is the growth of consumer culture. Um, and then also kind of looking at, you know, what what is, I want to say important, but um, the focus for us, you know, with counseling, right, is the psychological effects of being poor. And so 
not only does that have obvious impacts of, you know, access to things and availability of resources, um, but that there are a lot of, a lot of psychological impacts as well that, that we may face as counselors um, in the work that we're doing. Um, it talks about classism sort of in general, like um, kind of how this can play a part. And, um, you know, within that, it talks about the social mobility, you know, due to education um, and, and how we can counsel or, you know, um, address the needs of, of the underclass. Um, also um, services, counseling services and um, cultural acculturation, um, counseling in poor communities, which you may have gone over some in your counseling and community settings course. I don't know if you've already taken that or you still have that to take, but um, that should be covered somewhat in that course as well. Um, and then it, it talks about like middle-class culture and graduate school, which, um, you know, most of the people in graduate school would kind of fall in, into those lines of um, middle class, but also um, a lot of the individuals that we're going to be serving are going to be middle class. I mean, there's definitely going to be some on, on other ends, um, and specifically um, the poor, as we talked about, or um, some of the, you know, lower classes. Um, talks about the impact of class with therapists and um, relating to clients and things like that. As our nature as therapists, we're going to be, you know, pretty educated. We're going to have graduate degrees, and even though our field doesn't pay a ton of money, um, it's going to, at a minimum, potentially put us into that middle class um, category if we're not already there. And so that's going to have an impact, and it can bring about its own challenges when working with individuals. And so the next section then gets into implications of pover poverty in class for counseling. And so how does that impact us? How does it impact our clients? How does it impact the work we do with our clients? And kind of how do we respond to that? And then it has a brief response at the end of the chapters and all of the others. Um, getting into chapter 13, the models of community, um, I found this chapter to be really interesting. Um, it gives a, a decent amount of history as an introduction, but then it gets into how we kind of have looked at the communities, um, specifically within the United States. And so it starts off with this idea of the melting pot, which I feel like I continue to hear to this day, which is so frustrating because I first remember hearing about America as this melting pot when I was in first grade. Like I very vividly remember this analogy being drawn for me when I was in first grade. And so um, I'm going to kind of out myself as far as my age. Um, I was in first grade, gosh, 1985 to 86. So quite some time ago. Um, and at that time, I remember thinking like, that doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, if we're a melting pot, that means we all come together and everything about us is kind of stripped down and made into something new and different. Um, and that didn't feel right to me. And so as I got a little older, um, probably, you know, later in, in middle school, I recognized that, you know, our country is probably, or the goal, I guess, um, maybe not in reality, but should be more of a, a salad bowl, like this beautiful, bright salad, right? And so each of us brings our unique color and flavor and texture to the mix. Um, but coming together doesn't mean that we lose any of those things. Um, and, and maybe we gain some things by being together, but we don't lose any of that, you know, innately, those things that are unique about ourselves. And so that feels like that should be more of kind of how we're moving. But anyway, that's why it's frustrating to me to still hear the melting pot um, analogy today, you know, however many years later, um, when the idea of the melting pot really did happen. Um, and I think we've talked about this in the past about how there really isn't this like Euro white culture. Um, basically, our country is Eurocentric by nature, but um, most of us who have been here for a generation or two or three or more, um, have a hard time really identifying what our ancestors culture was um, because we kind of did come here and blend into something new and different. And then the expectation was that all immigrants should do so. And since a lot of the first immigrants, again, we talked about colonization and things like that were European, um, everybody else that immigrated from elsewhere or came over from elsewhere, elsewhere, whether it was voluntary or not, 
was expected to um, assimilate into the, that Eurocentric um, culture that was that was developed here in America. Um, and we recognize the challenges, we recognize the pain, the hurt, um, and just the wrongness of this and how this is not natural. And so anyway, my soapbox, um, the chapter next moves into segregation and where um, we recognize differences, but we felt like they should be separated from one another. And of course, we um, may know about the history of America with segregation and Jim Crow laws and things like that. And then where it's put us today, where even though technically segregation is not okay, um, it can still be practiced in, in many different ways and, and harmful. And so we moved into the integration phase, which, or the integration model, which was, you know, um, highlighted by, um, the Brown versus um, the Board of Education and, and you know, separate is, is um, not always equal, um, which really is connected to the next section that your text talks about, which is the civil rights movement, which um, was, uh, did a lot of really great work. And um, the leaders of that, um, you know, amazing heroic individuals, um, but unfortunately our country has kind of changed in some surface level ways, but a lot of the systems really haven't been addressed. Um, unfortunately, some of the things that that led to is things like affirmative action, which really at its core um, could have done a lot of good. Um, and I think that that was at the heart of um, where affirmative action came from. However, um, it, it has not always had the desired effects. Um, and has had a lot of pushback. Um, and so it, it really has not worked in the way that we really needed it to work, or maybe perhaps some people wanted it to work, which moved into this idea um, that we're, we've kind of been in for the past couple, I guess the past couple decades is the idea of multiculturalism and what that is and, and how to be multicultural individual. And since this is still a lot of where we are, um, the textbook talks about counseling implications for multiculturalism. And um, it's, it's a lot of what is sort of the purpose of most of the cross-cultural and diversity courses that you may take as a counselor. Um, it then gets into biculturalism, which is kind of having your own culture and a shared culture with other people. Um, it highlights um, this thing, this happening in New Zealand. Um, it talks about how this can be really beneficial, but also some of the drawbacks that, that occur. Um, cultural pluralism, um, and again, kind of that movement beyond multiculturalism and biculturalism. Um, not really having um, like a normative sense of uh, cultural difference, but really recognizing that there is that that pluralistic nature, um, you know, present in our society. And um, again, it, it kind of addresses some of the issues that 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 weren't taken into account in the other models, but um, again, has a ways to go. And then finally, it gets into the interculturalism, which is what we're talking about this semester, which is what this textbook is talking about, and how this really is the place we need to be um, moving towards if we're not already there, um, and helping the different systems and, and stuff like that move into this interculturality. Um, it has a discussion and a response, um, you know, at the end of the chapter. Um, by another individual. And so again, I feel like these two chapters really start to pull together, um, you know, the ways in which we've kind of taken this material and we continue to evolve and grow and, and develop our stance as culture, or excuse me, as counselors and um, what we can do with it. And so I like the practicality of, of these chapters. And obviously as we get into the last chapters, you'll see in the next video. So thank you for listening to this. Um, I hope that you enjoy those chapters. They're relatively short. Um, and, you know, definitely let me know if you have any questions or anything um, as we sort of round out the rest of the semester. Thanks.